Blessings in Yah, or English God, and Yahushua HaMashiach, or in English, Jesus the Messiah. This is so light, your voice for biblical encouragement and teaching from the word of Yahuwah. Let us as followers of Yahushua be the soul on the light, as in Matthew 5, 13 through 16. This is where truth is told and discussed, so your eyes may be opened and you be set free and have your minds renewed to the saving of your soul if you are not saved. I pray everyone is safe and well. For those who are new to this podcast, welcome. For those who are returning, welcome back. It's great to have you. Soul and Light is available on Getter, MeWe, YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram. Visit my pages on social media where I have two links posted. One takes you to a website where you can choose how to listen. We are available on Google Podcasts, Pocket Cast, Radio Public, Spotify, Podbean, Stitcher, Deezer, Buzzsprout, Good Pods, Castro, Castbox, Podfriend, Sirius XM and Pandora. The other link is to Patreon. So if the Lord so touches your heart to give and support this ministry, we thank you who are for you. So and Light comes to you from Alit You. Please feel free to download the free Alit You app. Don't forget to subscribe to the Salt and Light channel on YouTube as well. Give it a thumbs up and hit that subscribe button. Please like and share the link. Please visit Salt and Light Podcast group page on Facebook and YouTube. Also, Salt and Light Art group page on Facebook to see pics, reels of past and current paintings and art projects. Your support helps reach more people for the kingdom of Yahuwah and to level up as a podcast and grow this ministry. Once again, thank you for your support and prayers. We all need encouragement right now. Be blessed and safe. In the name of Yah, I love you all. Praise Yah. Praise our Elohim, the Almighty, our Creator. Um, this is Salt and Light, and coming to you from a new podcast platform, Alit You. We bless you um, in Yah, and uh, as we continue the series, um, I just want to remind everyone, um, you can catch all other 143 episodes on the various platforms, such as Stitcher, Podbean, um, Spotify, um, and numerous other platforms as well. Um, those, um, past episodes are no longer available on Anchor. Um, so again, this is a brand new podcast platform that I'm utilizing. Um, I'll let you, um, I'm happy to announce that the wave link is back up and running. Um, a couple of episodes ago, I know I said that, uh, it was broken, which it was, it was, it wouldn't, wasn't taking you to the website. Um, but now it is, uh, it's restored. Thank, thank God. And, um, as well as YouTube. Um, so while uh, my lit you account, you cannot see all past episodes. They're not, I wasn't able to import, um, the anchor RSS feed on there, but again, just look at, go back to Facebook, uh, YouTube, you'll be able to see all the episodes, um, Stitcher as well. Um, um, so you'll be able to go back and see all the past recordings that I've done, um, which includes the past episodes I've done in this series, the book of revelation series. So, um, all leading up to, I just want to, um, God, y'all willing, I will be talking about, um, how all this is lining up with, um, the end times and, that we as even believers are not truly prepared for what is to come. But Bible prophecy must come to pass. Um, the word of Elohim will come to pass. And in light of that, having our minds renewed as um, daily as our minds should be, right? And let us be exposed to the truth. Um, um, in every every area of our lives, and you know that we are we really aren't ready, and the world at large is really not ready for what is to come, um, you know, regarding the end times. And are we ready, even as people of 
of Yah um, spiritually, mentally, um, emotionally, psychologically, and even um, physically, you know, in the natural. Um, and preparedness and prepping and um, stockpiling and sustainability. I mean, all of these things. Um, you know, how are we as people of Yah are to be separated and called out from this world? Um, we are not to make friends with this world in that sense um, and, and thereby having ourselves compromised. Um, we're not to hold on to the things of this world and a lot of us still as believers in Christ, in Yahushua HaMashiach, is, uh, we're, still, um, we're still not set apart as we should be, consecrated and um, in, this, in sanctification and allowing him to do the work in us. So we have to do a lot of self-examination um, in light of the times we're living in, in light of Bible prophecy. Um, we have to ask ourselves, why aren't we as people of God prepared? Um, the first thing, you know, I don't want to take too much time with this, but the first thing is we need to be prepared spiritually. So praying, fasting, setting apart time, observing the Sabbath, um, whatever that looks like to you and to your family, um, uh, searching the scriptures daily, um, Bible study, being in his word, uh, being in unity, um, being a part of the body, you know, not being separate, not isolating yourselves, um, not allowing division to come between us as brothers and sisters in the faith, and so on and so forth. So, um, you know, God, God willing, I'll be able to, to bring that um, encouragement at the conclusion of this um, series, the book of on the book of Revelation. So, um, I just want to dive into, this is um, picking up um, in chapter 16. Um, the last episode I did was on chapter 15, the prelude to the bold judgments. And this is chapter 16. This is the culmination of the seven bold judgments. Um, so I'm reading from the New King James Version. Um, again, the caveat I'll put uh, right here, which I mentioned last episode. Um, I prefer to call God Elo either by the Hebrew names, either Elohim or um, Yahuwah or Yah, and Jesus Christ by his Hebrew name, Yahushua Hamachiah. And uh, so, um, obviously, the new, new, even the New King James Version doesn't um, have the Hebrew names there. I will substitute it, um, you know, and I'll switch back. You'll hear me say God and Jesus as well. Um, again, I've explained that that's just a personal conviction that the, from the Holy Spirit. Um, so I was picking up chapter 16. Then I heard a loud voice from the temple saying, go to the seven angels. Go and pour out the bowls of the wrath of Yahuwah on the earth. It's the first bowl, loathsome sores. So the first went and poured out his bowl upon the earth, and a foul and loathsome sore came upon the men who had the mark of the beast and those who worship his image. The second bowl, the sea turns to blood. Then the second angel poured out his bowl on the sea, and it became blood as of a dead man, and every living creature in the sea died. Then the third angel poured out his bowl on the rivers and springs of water, and they became blood. And I heard the angel of the waters saying, You are righteous, O Lord the one who is and who was and who is to be, because you have judged these things, for they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and you have given them blood to drink, for it is their just due. And I heard another from the altar saying, Even so, Lord Elohim Almighty, true and righteous are your judgments. Then the fourth angel poured out his bow on the sun, and power was given to him to scorch men with fire, and men were scorched with great heat. And they blasphemed the name of Elohim, who has power over these plagues, and they did not repent and give him glory. Then the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, and his kingdom became full of darkness, and they gnawed their tongues because of the pain. They blasphemed the Elohim of heaven because of their pain, 
pains and their sores, and they did not repent of their deeds. Then the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its waters were dried up, so that the way of the kings from the east might be prepared. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon, and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are spirits of demons, performing signs which go out to the kings of the sun of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of Elohim Almighty. Behold, I am coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. And they gather them together to the place called in Hebrew Armageddon. Then the seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air and a loud voice came out of the temple of heaven from the throne saying, it is done. And there were noises and thunderings and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, such as a mighty and great earthquake, as had not occurred since men were on the earth. Now the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell, and great Babylon was, was remembered before Yahuwah, to give her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. Then every, every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. And great hail from heaven fell upon men, each hailstone about the weight of a talent. Men blasphemed Elohim because of the plague of the hail, since that plague was exceedingly great. Praise Yah. Well, that was, again, chapter 16 from the New King James Version. Um, I just want to unpack it um, a little bit um, regarding the truth of Scripture. Um, we just go into a little bit of chapter 16 again, not to uh, the seven bold judgments, not to be confused with the seven trumpets, which was a warning, which was a warning to on the earth. Um, and, and just in preparation, this is actually the bold judgments are actually the pouring out of the wrath of Yah upon the earth so um then the we'll just look at uh, take a look at some of the different views again this um tool or book rather that um i've been using in this uh study on the end times the book of revelation um the book is called revelation four views revised and updated a parallel commentary um, by steve gregg um it it, regarding chapter 16, it does go quite a bit into it. So um, for the sake of time, um, I'm not going to go through because it does actually go through every single bowl and there's seven bowls and it goes through every single one and gives like the different views and interpretations of those. So I'll just go over a few. I'm not going to go. I'm not going to go over all seven again for the sake of time. Um but I just want to unpack, again, chapter 16 a little bit. Um, it says here, even uh, regarding verses 2 to 21, while the seven bowls have certain similarities to the seven trumpets, these are pronounced, there are pronounced differences. The plagues introduced by the trumpets were partial and constituted a call to repentance. The bowls are the execution of total judgment where there is no more hope of repentance. The first four bowls at the affect the environment, the last three, the realm of the monster, the brief rapid description suggests simultaneous rather than successive actions. The descriptive details are not to be understood physically, but as terrifying calamities. Uh, verse um, 16.2, the first judgment is similar to the sixth Egyptian plague. Um, verse 3, this plague is similar to the first one in Egypt. Uh, verse 4, unlike the Egyptian plague, which affected only the waters of Egypt, every source of Earth's fresh water is now affected, indicating complete judgment. Mm -hmm. um, verse 6, Yahuwah's judgment is retributive, retributive justice of equal weight with the crime. Verse 7, the voice of the martyrs affirms the right of Elohim to vindicate them. Uh, verses 8 and 9, no matter how intense the suffering, the people having lost the capacity did not repent. Like Pharaoh, their hearts are stubbornly defiant. 
uh, verses 10 and 11, the throne of the beast for John and his readers was the capital of the empire Rome, symbolic of all governments, especially eschatological Babylon, which oversteps its God-ordained boundaries. Verses 12 and 14, the Euphrates, the last barrier to total destruction, is removed, clearing the way for invasion from the east. The Parthians from beyond the Euphrates symbolize all future military invasions that would destroy the empire. Frogs symbolize the demonic work of this unholy counterfeit godhead, the false prophet. Although totally unaware of it, they are being used by Yah to accomplish his purpose, to gather them to battle. Um, that great day is when the total redemptive purpose of Yah will be consu consummated in both salvation and judgment. Verse 15, the day of the Lord will come unexpectedly and demands watchfulness on the part of followers of Messiah. It would be indescribable. It would be an indescribable blessing to those who are spiritually prepared. Verse 16, they are the demonic frogs. Armageddon or Armageddon may refer to the Mount of Megiddo at the upper entrance of the plain of Estragon, Israel's chief battlefield in ancient time. The thought is that it's not necessarily literal military conflict as no battle is described, but in any case, a spiritually divisive, decisive conflict involving the final overthrow, overthrow of the enemy by the power of almighty Elohim. And so we'll just look at the different views here on um, verse 17, verses 17 to 21, into the air, the judgment is universal, it is done, the judgment is complete. The great city called Babylon was Initially, Rome, the empire, and its capital symbolizing the judgment of Yahuwah and the rise and fall of nations and empires throughout history, as well as the end. at the end. People who have hardened their hearts chose to curse Elohim rather than to repent. Praise Yah. So, and we'll just look at a little bit of the different interpretations, different views. Um, just go back in the... In the book of Revelation series, I've spoken uh, quite a bit about um, the different views and different um, interpretations regarding eschatology on the study of the end times. Um, this is again from that book, the Revelation four views revised and updated. The first bowl of Revelation chapter 16, one and two, this is the historic view. This is the beginning of the series of calamities that have befallen and have yet to befall the papacy in the course of its gradual overthrow. The Ben, who had the mark of the beast and those who worship his image, have been understood to mean those who sustained a civil or secular power to which the papacy gave life and strength and from which it, in turn, received countenance and pr protection. Robert Fleming, in the first decade of the 18th century, published two books from the historic viewpoint called Apocalyptic Key and the Rise and Fall of the Papacy. Prior to this, about 1690, Fleming informed King William III of England that the bowls of judgment in this chapter of Revelation would begin to be poured out on the Latin kingdom in the year 1793 to 94, and that it would begin, if not in Italy, in France. In France, This he calculated by using the year-for-a-day method, beginning with the decree of Justinian, that made the Bishop of Rome supreme over all bishops in AD 533. Counting 1,260 years forward, he predicted a particular year, about a century after his own time, a year that saw the beginning of the French Revolution. The majority of historians, commentators, including Elliot Barnes and Cun Cunningham, re relate this vision to the French Revolution, seen as one of the major blows in modern history, weakening the papal power, but not yet eradicating it entirely. Right? Um, France was France was always more significant than most other nations to the sustenance of the papal system. The Pope themselves have often referred to the King of France as the eldest son of the church. The condition of France has often been a bellwether for the continent. Napoleon said a revolution in France is sooner or later followed by a revolution in Europe. Um, in the French Revolution, a foul and lonesome sore, that is the moral corruption 
atheism and general dissolution of society spread over those countries where the beast and his image were principally worshipped. And it kind of goes on regarding that there. Um, the preterist view throughout this section, preterists are divided concerning the recipient of these judgments. On the one hand, as we have mentioned earlier, um, several expositors believe that Jerusalem remains the object of wrath here as in the earlier chapter. Chapters other hold, others hold that while the first book of the half of the book dealt with Jerusalem, the second has shifted its interest to the fall of Rome. That second great prosecutor after Jerusalem of the church. J. Adams is among those who espouse the latter view. Chapter 16 describes the judgments upon the fall of Rome, the pouring out of the bowls of wrath in section two parallels. Those in no way recapitulates the sounding of the trumpets in, sec in section one. These two sequences alone represent judgment action and therefore alone predict the actual judgment periods upon Jerusalem and Rome respectively. Russell, who is of the Jerusalem camp, writes, it is to be observed that the area affected by these plagues is the land that is Judea, the scene of the tragedy. Depending upon which view one takes, those who have the mark of the beast would be either the royal, the loyal citizens of the Roman Empire generally, or else just the, view, the Jews in Palestine who have rejected Christ in favor of giving the allegiance to Rome. We have no king but Caesar. Assuming that one of the themes of the apocalypse is that Jerusalem has become the new Egypt and the church, the new Israel. The plague pictured here parallels that which came upon Egypt in Exodus 9, verses 8 to 12. It seems more than coincidental that this very plague was threatened against Israel when Moses was enumerating the judgments that he would send upon them if they proved unfaithful to his covenant. Where again in Deuteronomy 28, um, 20, verses 27 to 35, the Lord will strike you with the boils of Egypt with tumors, with the scab, and with the itch from which you cannot be healed. The Lord will strike you on her knees and on the legs with severe boils which cannot be healed from the sole of your foot to the top of your head. That these sores resist the healing can be seen in the fact that the people still were suffering from them when the fifth bowl was poured out upon them in verse 11. The principal significance of this plague will probably be symbolic, though such literal boils and rashes almost certainly became an epidemic in the besieged Jerusalem where sanitation was the first luxury to be lost. With dead bodies piled in rotting heaps throughout the day, throughout the city and the streets running with rivers of blood and sewage, it is no wonder that infectious diseases of every sort were rampant and unchecked. Yeah, so, and the, this is just the first bowl. The futurist view, view Tenney observes the seven bowls in chapters 15 and 16 are a closely knit series following each other in rapid succession. They parallel the trumpets in their spheres of action, but they are more intense. From the description of the events resulting from the pouring out of the first bowl, the general question arises whether we are given a symbolic or a literal picture of the events that will transpire. Though dispensationalists prefer to follow a literal hemineuric, whenever possible, some be... Some believe, some become uncertain at this point in the narrative, sometimes allowing for both a literal and a symbolic interpretation. For example, Ironside writes, I do not profess to be able to tell you just how much we are to take as symbolic and how much as literal in this secondary series of judgments. While it is undoubtedly true that we have symbols, also in these bold judgments, it is nonetheless possible that some of these plagues may have, besides the symbolical, also have a literal meaning. On the other hand, Wolverou, Riri, Sis, and others remain fairly consistent to the literalistic commitments to these bold visions. Cease writes, the greatest plagues of judgment of which we read in the past were those poured out upon ancient Egypt. They were literal plagues, which happened according to the terms in which they were recorded. The last plagues must therefore be literal too. Some considering the sores in the first bowl to be literal boils upon literal bodies, Look to entirely supernatural source for the affliction. Others find some naturalistic explanation, um, and it goes on and on. The last view concerning the first bowl is idealist, since no one was able to enter the temple until the seven bowls were poured out. Um, it must be that the voice from the, from the temple giving orders to the seven angels is that of 
Yahuwah himself. Like the seven trumpets that sounded in chapters 8 through 11, these bowls resemble the plates of Egypt, reminding the reader that the evil world under Satan's dominion resembles the Pharaoh's oppressive reign from which God's people have been delivered. It has often been pointed out that the domains affected by the numbered trumpets and their corresponding bowls are the same. The obvious difference is that each of the trumpets adversely affected only a third of whatever domain they touched, whereas the bowls produce utter and total ruin. Wilcox contrasts the trumpet with the bowls, pointing out that the former were God's warnings, the plagues poured out of the bowls are total, because the opportunity for repentance has gone. These are no longer warnings, but punishments. This correlation between the trumpets and bowls suggests to Hendrickson that the two series are parallel, Occurring simultaneously throughout the Christian dispensation, he writes, whoever refuses to be warned by the trumpets of judgment is destroyed by the bowls of wrath. For one individual, a certain calamity may be a trumpet of judgment, that is, a warning merely, while for someone else, the same event may be a bowl of wrath, that is the ultimate means of final destruction. In Hendrickson's view, a foul and awesome sore represents vicious and incurable ulcers of any incurable disease by which men die and are cast into hell. Haley takes the boils symbolically. He writes as in the human body where sores break out from an accumulation of impurities that permeate the whole body. So also in this case it is corruption of the world breaking out. Hobbes, who was partially a late date preterist, nonetheless applies the vision beyond his short range application to the fall of the Roman Empire. The seven angels are Yahuwah's messengers of wrath, sent forth to execute judgment upon the Roman Empire and beyond that, upon all the forces of evil at the end of the age. It does not take the, so the source of this plague literally, but writes, this symbolic way of picturing judgment will comfort John's contemporaries, but it also gives assurance to all believers throughout the ages who are persecuted by the devotees of political and material forces. And so, and again, that was just bowl one. Um, the second bowl, Revelation um, 16, verse 3, um, again, the stores view that the, that the sea would become blood as of a dead man is not to be understood literally, but as imaginary, implying that the ocean would become discolored and indicating that this was the effect of blood shed in great quantities on its waters. Since these bowls represent plagues of judgment upon the papacy, Barnes feels the proper application would be the complete destruction or annihilation of the naval force that contributed to sustain the papacy. Um, this we should look for a respect to the naval power of France, Spain, uh, and Portugal, for these are the only papal nations that have had a navy. Fulfillment of this pro prophecy is found in a series of great naval disasters that swept away the fleets of France, the most formidable naval power that had ever existed under papal rule. Um, preterist, the precise relationship between the seven trumpets and the seven bowls is difficult to determine. Clearly, there is a general correspondence between the successive elements affected. Although the trumpets effect is only partial, one-third, while the bowls affect the whole, it is remotely possible that the bowls are to be seen as another look at the same events represented by the trumpets. Though this seems unlikely in view of the difference just mentioned and the fact that the bowls are specifically associated with the seven last plagues. Possibly the trumpets depict preliminary calamities that fall upon Israel during the Jewish war, while the bulls present plagues associated with the final and utter devastation of Jerusalem. For those who see the second half of Revelation as depicting the fall of Rome, the difference in the extent of the two sets of judgment would be explained in terms of the trumpets being upon Jerusalem and the bulls more universally upon the empire at large. Futurist, this bull, like the second trumpet, affects the sea, where is whereas in the second trumpet one third of the sea became blood we are he, here read of the whole sea undergoing the same transubstantiation at this point there is a possibility of a symbolic or literal interpretation um idealist as the second trumpet affected the sea in revelation 8 8 so also this bowl is poured out on the sea resulting in a total preservation of that water of that body of water, pointing out that the first beast also arose from the sea, suggests that the sea may symbolize all of humanity. In this view, the vision brings into focus the utter putrefaction of a dead society. 
Hedging suggests that this bowl simply shows that when Yahuwah brings final judgment and death upon unrepentant sinners, he sometimes uses the sea as an instrument. Shipwrecks, sea battles, tsunamis, and other sea disasters serve as a bold judgment, a messenger of death upon wicked men whose time to repent has expired. But the same disasters will have a different impact upon survivors or those who hear of them, serving as trumpet warnings to bring them to repentance. He writes, this happens again and again throughout history. Right, so and again, the that was the idealist view. So the third bowl, you know, the again it affects this judgment and the third third trumpet. Um, both are said to affect the rivers and springs. And considering the third trumpet, we look for a fulfillment occurring in that region of Europe where the rivers and streams have their origins. The fulfillment was identified there with the invasion of Attila and the Huns. So also the fulfillment of this vision should be sought within those same portions of Europe. Um, the time frame of the first four bowls roughly coincide or begin with the French Revolution, but each bowl depicts a separate aspect of the crisis that came upon the papacy at that time. Um, that's the historic view, and it goes a little bit more into detail on the third bowl. On the preterist view, although some preterists understand this judgment along with the others of the series to be directed against the Roman Empire and its capital city, those who see Jerusalem's fall throughout the passage seem to have the advantage here, whether viewing it literally or figuratively. The pollution of the water sources did occur during the siege of Jerusalem, and streams of actual blood flow through the city. This can be seen as a literal fulfilling of this vision, though it is possible that a symbolic meaning is intended as well. Chilton writes, water is a symbol of life and blessing throughout scripture, beginning from the story of creation in the Garden of Eden. In this plague, the blessings of paradise are reversed and turned into a nightmare. What was once pure and clean becomes polluted and unclean through apostasy. Future view as a third trumpet made one third of the fresh water sources bitter, so the third bowl turns them entirely into blood. We are again faced with the possibility of taking a symbolic approach, as does Gabilin, when he writes, all the joys of life typ typified by rivers and fountains of waters are poisoned and corrupted. But Walvru exhorts us to hold out as before for a literal fulfillment. Though some have taken rivers and fountains to be symbolic, there is no reason for not taking this in the literal sense as the sea in the second bowl and the men in the first bowl. Angels proclaim uh, Yahuwah's justice in giving the rebels blood to drink since they have demonstrated Since they have demonstrated their bloodthirsty character by killing the righteous saints who prophesied against them. Wolver, Wolver writes, even as the saints are worthy of rest and reward, so the wicked are worthy of divine chastening and judgment. The bloodletting during the great tribulation as saints are slaughtered by the thousands is without the parallel in the history of the human race. The idealist view, idealists do not generally commit to any specific belief as to the fulfillment of a plague like this one. Most see the imagery of a judgment on the rivers and springs of water with the result that they became blood as merely a device to show Yah's ability to suit the punishment to the crime of the, sinners, of the sinners. Hendrickson's view would identify the fulfillment of this judgment with any occurrence to which men are destroyed by rivers and inland waters and drowning and poisoning. However, apart from mentioning the likeness of this plague to the first Egyptian plague, most skip over the question of how this gruesome picture is to correlate with historical realities and focus upon the statement of the angel of the waters. Sweaty writes, the spirit of the waters is so far from presenting, rep, resenting the plague that he bears witness to the justice which inflicts it. Summers and Hobbes interpret these judgments as primarily falling upon the Roman Empire and secondarily applying to other cases. Summers writes concerning the precise justice of this bowl as declared by the angel of the waters. Yah visits punishment in accordance with sin. Once the empire has made the blood of the martyrs run like water, now all of the empire can find to drink its blood and they deserve it. Yahuwah's judgments are righteous. The altar in verse 7 um, here is speaking its agreement because it was earlier associated with the prayers of the saints for justice to be done. Part of Yahuwah's answer to those cries was the sending of the tr trumpet judgments which were intended to warn the wicked to repent. Now in the bowls, we see the final answer to those prayers as 
Yah pours out unrelenting vengeance upon the unrepentant. So, and again, that's the third bowl, and it goes on and on. As I mentioned before, all the way to the seventh bowl, goes into the fourth bowl, the fifth bowl, the sixth bowl. Um, but for the sake of time, I'm not going to go into that. Um, but praise God for just, you know, again, the those interpretations. And as I've mentioned numerous times, um, whatever views we as believers hold on to regarding the end times, let us hold those views loosely. Um, I always say, and I, I firmly believe that, you know, we could all be wrong. Um, as I mentioned, the, I believe the last episode, a lot of believers are very dogmatic about the views that they hold um, concerning even the end times. And um, a lot of us, we, we're not teachable um, and don't allow humil you know, uh, right, humility to, to take the pro its proper place. Um, we could all be dead wrong in the views that we hold. Um, at the end of the day, it really doesn't, I'm not going to say it doesn't matter, but in light of eternity, what matters more than that is the unity of the brotherhood and even setting aside our views on certain things and certain topics, um, focusing on what does unite us, which is we, we need to be in agreement with the core tenets of the faith and our belief in Christ alone for the salvation of our souls. The Bible says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And um, so let us not be dogmatic about these, these views that we hold, um, you know, on so many different things, you know. Um, again, you know, not thinking that our view is, is the right one and thereby just, you know, if we have discussions with brothers and sisters, you know, we become like very, um, you know, um, dogmatic and just not, you know, not listening to another person's view and all that. That's why, you know, for me personally, just studying the different views and, and, and things like that, um, you know, I, I lean more towards the futurist view. Um, <clears throat> I don't. I don't, I'm not a historist um, um, or a preterist or partial preterist or, or anything like that. Um, you know, again, seek, you know, be in your word, um, spend time with the Lord and, you know, allow the Holy Spirit to lead you and guide you and give you revelation, right? Um, you know, while there's definitely nothing wrong with, you know, being fed right, from a certain uh, church or member, members of the body or congregation or pastor or leader, um, that should not be our first go-to. Our first go-to should be the source of the living water itself, which is Yahushua HaMashiach. Um, go to him. Um, get, allow the Holy Spirit to give revelation, again, in light of scriptures and Bible prophecy. And um, you know, allow him to be the one to reveal to you, you know, even regarding which view you ascribe to. Um, but again, in light of Bible prophecy, even, you know, what's going on in the world today, um, you know, continue to pray for divine appointments, you know, as we go about our daily lives as believers um, to Allow the Holy Spirit to give us a word in season and out of season. Just, um, you know, uh, be the salt and the light. And to allow that, um, you know, just to give, to sow a seed, you know, to give a word, to let people know why we believe the things we believe and uh, that we are to understand that we are called to be set apart from this world, um, you know, and, and the views that we hold is is um, a biblical worldview uh, through a biblical lens. What does the Bible say about these things? What does the Bible say about the times we're living in? 
um, what does God say about um, these things? Because people are looking for answers, um, believe it or not. People are really, really lost without Christ and without hope in the world. But, you know, and the devil will just keep, you know, deceiving them and their minds need to be reprogrammed. They need to be unplugged from the matrix um, against just wrong thinking, wrong uh, uh, indoctrination, uh, all of these things. Um, they've been told a lie from the beginning and believing the lie and not giving glory to the almighty Elohim, our creator, um, the maker of heaven and earth and the God of the Bible, um, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the God of Israel, the he of, of the Hebrews, and not understanding. I, you know, I've spoken to many people, even uh, those who say I, I was brought up Christian, but are still celebrating and following to the, the traditions of man and really like pagan, uh, everything that's pagan, everything that is not of God. And so on one breath, they're saying that they were brought up this way. But it's like, I, I, I hear you, but with all respect, the Bible says this, you know, um, you can't, you know, intermingle light with darkness, you know, um, you know, to, to expose the deeds of darkness or, you know, to expose them, to, not to go along with them, not to go along with the things of this world just for the sake of fitting in, you know, so, you know, I just, I just pray that that blessed you, um, again, I pray that the whole series on the book of Revelation is blessing you, um, pretty soon we're just gonna, you know, wrap it up, so, um, next episode we'll discuss chapter 17, the Scarlet Woman and the Scarlet Beast, and, um, and then go back, um, discussing the seven letters to the seven churches and now we'll wrap it up um on the the series on the series and the reason i mean the lord had just led me um to do it kind of breaking it down chapter by chapter because it is a lot to unpack um the book of revelation is very um uh is deep you know it's 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 so many things it's you know and regarding the different views is it literal is it symbolic is it you know are you know how are we to understand this the scriptures and you know in the book of revelation what's going on um and how to apply it to our lives today how how are we to understand it again it's the holy spirit that brings understanding um you know, and let us not be deceived and let us stray. You know, I personally believe that even historicist and partial preterism and preterism, all these views are error. You know, the more and more you research these things. But again, you know, I pray for brothers and sisters who hold to those views that the Lord would show them um, in light of scripture that, you know, it, it is error to be so, again, dogmatic about these things and only see it as as this, you know, and this is it, you know, it's, it's either all symbolic or it's either all literal or it, it's a, a marriage between the two. Um, but again, being able to say, um, you know, being able to believe and even say publicly, but I, I hold this view, but I could be wrong. You know, um, there's nothing wrong with saying that. You know, um, because a lot of us say, well, this is what it is. You can search the scriptures, you know, search the scriptures, but I'm right. You know, in other words, like in order to for someone to say I'm right, someone else has to be wrong. And it's really not about that. You know, it's like the in, in times past, the Berenians, they purpose in their heart to um, read the scriptures daily to see if these things were true. You know, even the Bible says, let let's us as followers of Yahushua HaMashiach um, and, and our Elohim, let us come together and reason together. You know, and 
we can have those conversations, you know, as brothers and sisters in Christ um, and be open about it and have discussions and not allow offense or all of these things to, to get a foothold in, in our relationships and in, in, in our lives and in, in our thinking. So again, the Bible says, let us be transformed by the renewing of our minds. And that goes for all of us. So again, I just pray that that blessed you. Um, in the name of Yahushua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, our Messiah. God bless you all. I pray that you have a blessed weekend. And just look for us again on Facebook, on YouTube, and on all the various platforms that I mentioned before. Again, we're coming to you from AlitU, a brand new podcast platform. God bless you all in the name of Yah. Thank mm-hmm. you.